five, four, three, two. Good afternoon, my friends. The doctor's in the house. How's everybody doing today on this great Wednesday? My name is Mark Gomez, but you can call me Dr. G, and welcome to To Your Health with Dr. G. We're going to have a great show today. I want to just make a quick note. Please follow me on my website, www.drmarkgomez.com. Also, check me out on my Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook handles at To Your Health Dr. G. Today, this episode is called A Call to Action Public Health and Community Engagement. And I have assembled a great team of experts today um, that are just, are just great educators and great practitioners of public health. And we're going to really talk about why is public health important and what is our social responsibility, our community responsibility to help out with engaging in healthy behaviors and hopefully those healthy behaviors leaving, leading to thriving, longevity, vitality, and great quality of life. So welcome back. For all the new listeners, each week I gather a group of experts and we talk about health topics. For my previous listeners, welcome back to the show, and I hope you guys really enjoy this. It's going to be a spectacular show. Quick disclaimer, as I always hit you with a quick disclaimer. All right, the content of To Your Health with Dr. G is for informational and entertainment purposes only, and that the content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, and or treatment. For further details, you can visit www.toyourhealthwithdrg.com, hashtag disclaimer. I want to give a quick shout out to our, uh, our uh, Silver Level sponsors today. We are very blessed to have some great support from community organizations. First group, uh, Benedictine University, www.ben.edu. My next sponsor, DuPage County Health Department at www.dupagehealth.org. And last, Total Body Wellness and Performance www.totalbodywellness.net. All right, so again, my name is Dr. G. Mark Gomez. I'm a practicing internist in the area. I've been in biz business and practice for 11 years now at Edward Hospital. And again, today we have a great crew here for you. So our question of the hour, and what we do each week, we talk about a chief complaint. And the question of the hour today on our public health show is, <clears throat> what is our social responsibility, if any, as individuals, to improve the collective health outcomes of the communities we serve. So what I want to do right now is I want to introduce uh, my esteemed guests, and uh, I've known them for quite some time. And uh, I'm going to start with my first guest to my right, Dr. Susan Chang, who I've known for I don't know, three, four, or five years, a couple years at least. And uh, Dr. Chang and I met uh, on the advisory panel when I was invited to be on the advisory panel for the Master's in Public Health program at Benedictine University a few years ago. Uh, so, Dr. Susan Chang is an amazing individual, of course. She is, she, she's a PhD, she's a Master of Public Health, she's Assistant Professor and Department Chair of the Master of Public Health at Benedictine University in Lyle, Illinois, and I'm very, very happy to have you here. I reached out to Dr. Chang uh, uh, probably about a month or so ago for this show, and I wanted to, uh, when I wanted to do a public health show, I really said, who do I know in the area, in the, in the industry? that really has a keen sense of the pulse of public health. So welcome, Dr. Chang, to the show. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and, um, and also uh, about your perspective on public health. Sure. Um, I thanks. know that's a very broad question. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Mark, for inviting me on the show today. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, well, first and foremost, I am an epidemiologist, so I study a wide range of diseases from chronic to infectious to diseases of aging to population health. Um, I join academia because I really enjoy teaching. I think that's a strong driver for most people who join a university. I truly believe that you know one of our greatest responsibilities as practitioners is to help train the next generation to follow us and to someday replace us and hopefully to inspire us and to help us understand what the um, problems are of the current time, not just what we think they are, but what they actually are in our communities. Um, so teaching was a very strong motivator for me to go back into academia after practicing. Um, I worked in emergency preparedness for 12 years prior to joining academia. So I worked at the state level and at the local level, um, trying to help the state of California become more prepared for any potential event that might arise 
Um, and on a personal level, I'm the mother of two little girls. They're uh, five and nine. They're the reason I look 10 years older than I should. Um, but they're a lot of fun. And I think when people ask, you know, why am I so passionate about some of my projects? And I have to tell them, among other reasons, among a professional um, interest and an intellectual interest, you know, my children live in this community. This is their neighborhood, this is their school, this is their um, country, their state, their future. And as a parent, I think it's as much my responsibility to try to make their world safer and healthier and better than when I came into it. So I have many reasons for loving public health. Excellent. Thank you, Susan. My next guest uh, is Larry Love. And for uh, those of you that have been on the show before, that, that have paid attention and listened to the show, uh, Larry was one of my guests a few weeks ago, and I wanted to invite him back because I think he's a very dynamic uh, individual. Uh, he has a unique perspective on, on talking about health, and, and I think that's really relatable to how we go through our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, as Dr. Chang just said, uh, she's a family person, and so am I, and we, of course, we do a lot for our families as far as our, our health, but again, what is our responsibility for the community at large? We know we, we do a lot of things, but now, uh, Larry Love, why don't you go ahead and uh, give us a, a quick rundown of what does public health mean to you? And really quickly, Larry Love uh, is the owner of Total Body Wellness and Performance in Lyle, in, um, in um, Westmont, Illinois, thank you, uh, www.totalbodywellness.net. So Larry, what's your perspective? Again, public health is a very broad topic, but what's your perspective on how you view things? And as you said, Dr. G, public health is a very broad topic. However, um, it's really important to understand the needs assessment of the market that you're pursuing. Many times it's easy to say what some community or some neighborhood should be doing in retrospect to health and wellness or just individual living and family living. But we must first take the due diligence of understanding what's the needs assessment of a community. After the needs assessment, we have to be willing to listen to that community because it's, it's, it's a lot of times it's portraying different protocols on communities, but if you don't know what they need, how can you help them? And then further, after understanding what they really need, now it's application, planning, but most importantly, it's follow-up. And so I haven't met a person yet that says they want to wake up and be unhealthy. I haven't met a person yet that states, you know what, I want to wake up and, and live in a neighborhood of unhealth. So it's our responsibility, not only as professionals, but I think as citizens contributing to society, to ensure that our surroundings are a surrounding that we contribute to from a health perspective, a wellness perspective, and then just citizenship. So. We'll talk more about that today. Thanks. And my last guest today that I want to introduce is a gentleman that I met recently, but through an affiliation with the DuPage County Health Department, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Christopher Hoff, uh, who's a master of public health. He's a dynamic individual, and uh, he is the Assistant Director of Community Resources for the DuPage County Health Department. Uh, visit them at www.dupagehealth.org. Chris, welcome to the show, and why don't you give us a quick take on your sense of what does public health mean to you? Yeah, awesome. Thanks for having us. We're really excited and uh, excited to join the show. So to me, public health is not just a profession, but it's a passion too. Uh, and so much of our health is determined outside of the doctor's office, outside of healthcare access in general. It's where we live. It's where we work. It's the relationships we have. So the importance of public health to me is really making sure that the communities we live in are healthy and that they are productive, uh, nurturing places to live, work, play, pray, all those things, uh, and that where you uh, interact with uh, all those things is really promoting health and isn't detrimental to you know, living a healthy life. Nobody wants to wake up uh, unhealthy. Nobody wants to be sick. Everybody wants to live a really healthy sure. life. So I think from a public health perspective, governmental public health, working at DuPage, uh, it's engaging with communities to help mm -hmm. find solutions to those problems. We just got out of a big community health assessment today, actually, and I came straight from there, so I'm re-energized by public health, but your point is well taken. Mm -hmm. It's nice to identify those needs, but then it's really working with communities to implement change and get people involved in, in making those changes so that they really are sustainable. So, That's excellent. Thanks, Chris. Well, uh, I want to kind of give my perspective on public health, and again, yes, it's a broad topic, but so as a practicing physician, of course, my job is to make sure that people 
are living to the best that they can live. Uh, I think about chronic health disease burden that affects us a lot, affects our populations and affects our communities. Uh, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, these are things, these are conditions that touch almost everybody uh, in some way, shape, or form. And so my job as the physician is to make sure that people are screened, that people have a follow-up, that people have those resources to be as successful as they can be in the lives they want to live. And hopefully, as I tell my patients, hopefully I don't have to visit you in the hospital. I don't like going to the hospital. I like actually being in the clinic more often, but, but that's really our job as physicians, as a, certainly as a primary care physician, is to make sure that somebody has those resources to do well and hopefully avoid chronic disease burden. And then we're hoping on the back end that we get the longevity and the vitality and the quality of life. But when we think about public health, obviously, we think about the communities that we live in, the community at large. And I've got an interesting quote here. This is a quote that I found. Uh, it was from 1920, so we're getting a little historical perspective to <laughs> our listeners out there, uh, uh, by a gentleman by the name of Charles Edward Armory Winslow. And he's kind of considered, he was kind of considered like the godfather of public health in this country. So he was an epidemiologist and uh, a biostatistician. And he says, he was published this in his work in 1920, he defined public health as, quote, the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting human health through organized efforts and informed choices of society, organizations, public and private communities, and individuals. And even though that quote was from 1920, that resonates today. Yeah. Uh, so the same challenges, certainly disease burdens have shifted over the last 100 years, but some of those same challenges are things that we can identify with that they were talking about 100 years ago. So before I dive into the next kind of series of questions, I want to just not, uh, do a quick shout out to Benedictine University, again, one of our sponsors. Benedictine University is where affordability meets advancement. Imagine car your career possibilities with a CEF accredited graduate degree in public health from Benedictine University. Our MPH program is offered on campus or online and is designed to fit your busy lifestyle. Visit ben.edu slash grad adult to get started. Thank you, Benedictine University. So I want to ask this question to, to Dr. Chang. Um, so as I, was thinking, as I was preparing for today, I was thinking about, wow, these are some great individuals that we have on today. And i got to somehow stimulate their brain, their <laughs> brains to, uh, to get some good information. And a lot of our, our viewers, or I don't want to assume anything about our, our, our viewers uh, or our listeners. And again, we talked earlier about public health as being a very broad, broad topic. And I guess the question that I have is, what are some of the sub-areas areas that viewers or listeners may not know what public health is? So... <laughs> the first question. <laughs> now, sure. what are some areas that, that, that we don't think about that's public health? So, putting my <laughs> teaching cap on, um, very briefly, there's three different kinds of prevention when it comes to disease, right? There's primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. To work backwards, tertiary prevention tends to be when a disease is fairly advanced, and so you're looking at some pretty strong interventions like. Um, you know, if you're looking at liver failure, you're looking at transplants, right? So we're talking surgery most of the time. Um, secondary prevention tends to be once you already have the disease, it's to slow it down. Um, it's to try to maintain your quality of life for as long as possible, even though you've been diagnosed with a disease. Um, and I tend to see physicians in categories two and three a lot, right? Surgeons and trauma surgeons in category three. A lot of physicians like Dr. Gomez in category two, once you're diagnosed, because that's when you go to the doctor. Um, what public health does is we try to work a lot in category one, primary prevention. We are, what we hope to be is a safety net that catches society whenever things go wrong, and hopefully if that safety net comes with enough warning signs, you don't even get close to needing the safety net. Um, so public health works in a lot of ways that are maybe invisible to you, and hopefully if we do a good job, you won't really see us working. Um, they work on legislation, things like the reason you're wearing a seatbelt every day in your car is because we found that seatbelts prevent fatalities when they're car accidents. The reason your babies are in car seats is because we find that car seats significantly decrease injury when there's car accidents. Um, the reason that there are warning boxes whenever you buy a pack of cigarettes or when you look at drugs is because we know that warning individuals and what they're consuming can potentially inform their choices. So 
I hope that answers the question. It's invisible, but everywhere. We're kind of like Big Brother, but really nice. So kind of like Big Auntie Jane, who's trying to help. I think you hit that on the nail. When I see patients in my practice, it's usually at the time that there's some sort of pathology that's already taking place. And we want to really say, hey, we want to put our resources more in uh, the primary prevention mode. Uh, you know, and that kind of seg segues, you know, of course, in this day and age, municipalities and communities are strapped with money, and it may impede those efforts of primary prevention. Chris, what's your thought on this? You know, you, you're with the DuPage County Health Department and uh, certainly a governmental body. How do you guys make public health work when sometimes maybe the financial dollars may not be there? Yeah, it's a great question. Everybody's dealing with it now with fewer and fewer resources, like you said. So a lot of the work that public health is able to do well is around some of these policy changes um, that don't necessarily take a lot of money to implement a program. And we didn't see 1,000 people or 10,000 people to convince each one of them to make a change. Um, Seatbelts is a great example. You know, it's a wide-sweeping policy that prevents a lot of premature injury and death. Uh, right now, we have an issue around tobacco and access to tobacco products for youth. We know that uh, people who start smoking before they're 18 tend to smoke at higher rates and for longer duration throughout their life. Um, so municipalities are looking at policy changes that they can implement locally to reduce access to some of those things that we know are detrimental to health and know uh, that avoiding those products, tobacco products, will enable you to live healthier, longer, higher quality of life. Um, it doesn't necessarily take a million dollars to implement. It takes a lot of goodwill. It takes a lot of relationship building. It takes the science of public health. Uh, it takes the legislative process, but it's kind of a, an exciting way to impact the health of whole communities uh, in one sweep, rather than trying to convince, you know, in DuPage's case, a million people at a time, one by one, trying to have that conversation. So. Thanks, Chris. Larry, you, you were involved in the community a lot, and, and what, what are your thoughts about the, the, the top two or three areas of concern that are really important right now in public health? Yeah. Great question, Dr. G. First of all, Dr. Chang and Chris, they, they centered around prevention. But when we uh, go a little further with prevention, we want to talk about awareness. And so everyone, you know, needs education, but the awareness piece must then progress to accessibility. Accessibility of tools and, and uh, arenas of where the community can come, come get better knowledge, you know, get help. And help is not always a physical tool. Sometimes it's just mental positioning and knowing that they have the support of the community and the public health community. And then last is really health literacy. Um, literacy of, and again, that's reciprocal. The public health sector has to be able to relate to the community, but the community has to be able to understand the public health sector as well. So going a little further, in particular, people think of movement as, you know, they take that for granted. And there's a lot of communities that just don't move because they don't have access to, you know, particular arenas in a community such as a park district that may have a walking track for outdoors. If it's indoors, they may not have equipment to adjust to, you know, some different strength training. It could be something as simple as body weight exercises. And then lastly, the, the, the thing that really is my passion right now is it's not just reacting to things. It's being very proactive. So a lot of people react to movement because maybe they're overweight. There's an obesity issue in the community. But, hey, let's be proactive by providing access so kids can start at an early age moving. And then if they move, they can do it with their families. And then it becomes a, you know, a very cohesive campaign. I want to piggyback on what you said about access, and that's certainly one of the key issues out there with public health. But another issue that we that we don't talk about as much is equity. Mm -hmm. uh, when we look at healthcare disparities, uh, and as you said, communities that may or may have certain resources, that there's a big equity issue, and the old saying, the haves and the haves nots. And and as we're talking about um, public health, and, and as Dr. Chang was mentioning, and and Chris about smoking cessation, you guys gave me this image as I'm hearing you guys talk about the old Surgeon General C. Everett Coop. <laughs> and uh, and I, you know, growing up as a kid in the 80s, right. I mean, and I remember uh, once he was, <laughs> he, he was my <laughs> Surgeon General. Uh, the, the, the beard without yeah. the mustache. Yeah. Uh, but Dr. C. Everett Coop, of course, was a, was a pediatric surgeon, uh, really was a pioneer in, in breakthrough surgeries for pediatrics back in the 50s and the 60s and really pioneered a lot of stuff and he was really big on some of the campaigns that Dr. Chang even mentioned about smoking cessation and getting labels put on uh, on products 
And I found an interesting quote from him, and he says, quote, health care is vital to all of us some of the time, but public health is vital to all of us all of the time. Nice. And I can't agree, can't agree more. You know, uh, Dr. Coop, he, uh, he had, had a very long life. He lived to be 96 years old. That's pretty good longevity. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we all want. Uh, I want to transition to a, another topic, uh, but this next section uh, is brought to you by DuPage County Health Department. Is there unused or expired medicine in your home? The DuPage County Health Department offers RX box for safe and proper disposal. Please get that medicine out of your home and in an RX box. Go to dupagehealth.org slash RX box for locations and instructions. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the tech that's out there. Uh, social media has just so many possibilities out there. And when we're talking about, uh, talking about public health, I mean, we've all seen social media ads for meetups, exercises together, moving together. Uh, so I'm really, in, I'm really interested from a public health perspective. How does social media maybe help us out in, in, in maybe addressing these issues of access or equity? So I'll ask Dr. Chang, what are your thoughts about what are your thoughts about social media as a tool now in getting us healthier as a society? Sure. Uh, first of all, I don't believe in social media. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> she was um, on her cell phone <laughs> outside. I saw it guys. On Facebook, yeah. posting my stuff. Yeah. Um, no, I would say that, you know, what's an interesting challenge for public health right now, I think, is behavior change and changing the attitudes and perceptions. Um, you know, what Larry was saying about awareness and trying to do proactive fitness before you get to the point where you need a doctor, I think there is a lot of awareness and education in most of society, um, but it's really difficult to integrate some of those changes. You know, mm -hmm. I know that spinach is healthier for me than french fries, but I really like french fries, <laughs> right? Like, I know going vegetarian yeah. is probably healthier than eating hamburgers all the time, but I really love a good Portillo's hamburger, right? Like, I get it. Um, so I think the interesting thing about social media, and I can bring up two very quick studies, because I know we can talk a lot academics. Um, one, there was a study recently of the top 10 habits that would prolong longevity. So what are the 10 things you can do that would help you reach 90 years old, 100 years old, 110 years old? And one of them is social connections. Number one and number two, in fact, were both um, your friends and your relationships, right? So not living alone and also, and by relationships, I don't even mean marriage. I mean having a roommate, having someone you love that you live with, that you enjoy hanging out with. And the second thing was friendships. So having strong relationships um, outside of your home. And the other study was that uh, if you look at people across the board, you tend to be about the same size as your friends. And what's interesting is it's not even geographic. So you tend to be about the same size as your friends around the country and around the world, and it tends to be the social element. So I think what social media can really do is create these supportive environments that can underlie the behavior change that's necessary to integrate that education, that awareness. So when people do weight loss challenges, when they do squat challenges, plank challenges, when they try and train for 5Ks and they support each other, um, you know, when they start going to more healthy lifestyles, when they're cooking real food and getting away from processed food, all of that really helps when social media is kind of the tool that they use. I know in our, in our office uh, we've uh, done work challenges where, you know, office, office staff will go in together to to try to lose weight and things like that. And I think there's some power in that yeah. if it's used the right way. But going back to everything that we're saying, you've got to have some rituals, and, and rituals are a foundation towards behavioral change. Uh, and without those rituals, it's hard to, and some of that dedication, let's be honest, you have to have some, a little bit of sacrifice. Uh, without that, then it may be hard to impart some change on a global scale or a much larger scale. Uh, Larry, what's your thoughts about uh, social media? You know, you're, you're a guy that's uh, on his cell phone a lot and you're on <laughs> Instagram and all that stuff. But how do you, how would, how do you use it in your, in your particular practice? Do you use it at all? And uh, how do you promote social media yeah. to help out with public health? Yeah. I am a big social media proponent. Um, a lot of people see social media differently, but I, I really gained a better understanding of how to use it as a demonstrative tool. Uh, by posting videos, and also uh, to piggyback on what Dr. Chang alluded to, people want to be a part of something. And so if they have a cohesion or something of comfort that they can relate to, 
they're probably going to be a little bit more compliant. Now, when it comes to health and wellness, and even if we want to throw the fitness and performance arena in there, people are always looking to better themselves. So if they can find a reputable source, and then from the standpoint of me putting out evidence-based you know, tools and videos, it can be very proactive and productive. Uh, in addition, I think as we continue to understand that the internet or in a social media scene, there's so much mythical information out there. If you have a credible source, people gravitate to that. So again, it comes back to that social responsibility of public health. There was a, as Dr. Chang was saying earlier, what about relationships being the foundation? This has been said, I agree with her, and, and a few weeks ago I made a, I talk, we talked on this show about uh, the Blue Zone projects that, that have been out there. When you look at, and the Blue Zones for, for new listeners are, are populations worldwide that have the longest living, but also the healthiest living too, and the least amount of disease burden. And so you're looking at uh, places like uh, Japan, Okinawa, Japan, you're looking in Greece, in, in Icarus, you're looking in uh, Italy, you're looking in Costa Rica, in the region called Nicoya, you're looking at Loma Linda, California, and one of the key things, you're right, is, is the relationship aspect. Uh, and now, of course, they've got some other decent behaviors, but relationships do form a foundation amongst everything, and that is, and then we go back to say, well, we don't want to burn relationships, you want to have proper relationships and people that can identify and support you along your ways. Now, not everybody has that potential resource there, and so that does make it a little more of a challenge if you don't have, have those relationships, but, but we're hoping that as a community, and that's what we're hearing a lot about here today, is community can help support in our health outcomes as well. Chris, at the county level, are you guys using social media to engage uh, the, the, the constituents, the, the residents of the counties that they serve? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Larry stole my line, I think. I, you know, I apologize. There's, there's so much information out there, and there's a lot of misinformation mm -hmm. sometimes. And I think people, when they're looking for health information, you know, tend to look where they are. They're looking on Facebook, they're looking on Instagram, they're looking on these social networks to find out about health information and health news. What we want to try to do is to be that authoritative, credible source that people go to to find out about uh, what they can do, how they can engage with public health, how they can participate. Um, and so for us, it's putting information out. Uh, it's helping to kind of overcome the barrier of, like, nobody knows about public health unless you're impacted by it. You don't know that people take for granted the water is clean, the food is safe, that you're not sick, because it happens every day. It doesn't, nothing happens. So we kind of go under the radar. So for us, social media is a tool to engage with people, help them see the benefits of uh, a well-funded, well-resourced, effective, really, public health system that is there every day, that you don't get to a point where people take it for granted, and then you've got some big outbreak or some big issue that you're trying to be reactive to. Uh, so for us, yeah, social media is a tool for us to put out information, hopefully to engage with people, and we invite people to you know, contact us through there. It's not everybody that can come to a 9 a.m. government public health meeting on a Tuesday. We work, we have you know, kids, we have family responsibilities, we take care of parents, whatever it is. Uh, or on social media, you've got the opportunity to kind of interact uh, outside of those real formal government structures that you know, we're so used to and have to bust our way out of sometimes. I want to ask you, I want to change the script a little bit, but uh, you know, as a physician, I think of what public health issues that come to me if I say, okay, what are the top things that I see that are challenged? Of course, the, oh, the obesity epidemic is a big challenge. Uh, the opioid epidemic is a big challenge, and we're going to have a show on that in a few weeks. Uh, uh, Diabetes is still a big and it's still a big challenge in the complications of that. And certainly as primary care physicians, we, 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 we sometimes seem inundated with the chronic disease burden now. Certainly uh, without getting super political or anything, uh, with, with healthcare reform, we've gotten more and more patients into our practice, which is a good thing for us as practitioners and hopefully as public health proponents, uh, another opportunity to help drive down chronic disease burden. So instead of having people that are sick and they just wait and wait and wait and then finally enter the system, you know, at the emergency room level when, when, when we're already behind eight ball, now we're hoping to get more and more people back in from more of a primary uh, uh, perspective or a secondary prevention perspective. So I want to ask this question to, I'll ask Larry this question. What do you think the role is of business in public health? Is there a role for business minus the, the profits but does business have a social responsibility as far as community health? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> what, you're, what you're telling a community when you set up a business in that community is that you want to be a part of that community, 
but reciprocally, you want them to be part of your business. And so the social responsibility has to lead to interaction with the community. Chances are that whatever business you have, yeah, you may get people outside of the community to patronize you, but you know, you want the person next door to patronize you as well. Um, going a little further, I think, and I can just speak for me, um, with my business, uh, I enjoy being out in the community. It's good marketing, but at the same time, it's helping people. And as Chris and Dr. Chang alluded to, you know, public health is one of those things where if people don't really see something being done, they kind of take it for granted that it just happens. It's almost like they see the actor in front of the camera, but they, who has to run a camera for the actor to be seen? And so that's kind of like, to me, equates to, to business. you got to be out there. You do have a social responsibility for helping the community. And as well, longevity. You want to have an a engaging a relationship over a long period of time. But as well, you want people to see that business as a contributing factor in the community. Chris, what do you think the role of government is in public health? I know uh, you're at more of a, at, at the at the county level, but there is is there a bigger role that should be done? Of course, we have CDC that sends out a lot of guidelines. We have our Illinois Department of Public Health that does things, but but a lot of people may not know some of the behind the scenes action that's going on. But but what is their responsibility? What is the government's responsibility in helping out with public health? Yeah, it's a good question, and I think government has you know, kind of the core functions of safe water, safe food, safe clean air. Uh, that you want to make sure are there and foundational. The other role of governmental public health can play and tends to do well is try to convene some of these different partners to address health problems. No one organization can address any of these crises alone, whether it's chronic disease or opioids or mental health. There's no one hospital, no one business, no one community that can do that. So our role is often to be that convener to say, here's the problem, let's identify, let's assess the community, find out what the need is, and then figure out who the right partners to, to play and bring them to the table. They've all got resources. Everybody wants to contribute. They want to be involved. We talked about that earlier. So how do you structure uh, a system in which people can bring their resources to the table and actually do something about the problem? And we don't have all of these agencies out doing something different, all going different directions. But we're all kind of lined up down the same path trying to make change uh, and measuring our progress, evaluating, looking for funding, all those things. And we're doing it together rather than all randomly spirited across the community. I think it comes down to relationships again as well, and we talked about you know, societies that live a long time. They have very co very good core relationships, but even when our, in our efforts here, it's, it's really about having a collective vision, mm -hmm. and certainly you know, another no reason why I've got you all on the show today is mm -hmm. we all have a collective vision and a shared sure. social responsibility. Dr. Chang, from your end, you know, from academia, you help train the next generation of healthcare leaders, uh, the next generation of, of public health experts, What's your take on the role on from your end? Because you're really kind of you're really kind of shaping and harnessing the the next generation. Uh, so you definitely have uh, a stake in, in how we do as a as a society. Sure. Um, so I'm going to use a very quick anecdote. When I was pregnant with my first child, I had a colleague who had children who were grown, and he said, "If you're very lucky and you pay attention, your child might just make you a very good parent." And I thought at the time, that's interesting, right? Uh, now, as an instructor, as a teacher, you know, one of our jobs, I think, as academics is to make sure that we're being agile and flexible, that our curriculum and our training is not staid and it's not just traditional, that we're giving them a strong foundation, but we're tackling the new problems, right? So when I was coming up, one of the big problems was HIV. We spent a lot of time working on HIV prevention um, and on HIV treatment. Now I think the focus has changed. I think it changes every 10 to 20 years, and I think it's important to train a cadre of um, public health professionals for the next generation that understands the role of social media, that understands that cyberbullying is different than maybe the bullying we had growing up, and that you know suicide rates are increasing in some of our communities, and that's tied to a certain amount of mental health that looks different than it did 20 years ago. The opiate epidemic is a large part of you know, what has come before it, whether it's uh, chronic pain that's not managed well, or if it's mental health, or underlying access to care, or stigma, or any number of these overlapping conditions. As, um, I think as, you know, someone who's training those professionals who are going to work with Chris in the next five, 10 years, they have to be able and skilled to take on the next challenge, but we have to be flexible in what that next challenge is, and to be receptive 
as people in their early 20s are coming into programs to listening to what they've seen in the field and what is concerning them. So for us to stay modern and relevant. Excellent. Uh, this, next, the, this next segment is brought to you by Total Body Wellness and Performance. Total Body Wellness and Performance provides integrated wellness and performance services resulting in an optimal healthy lifestyle to focus on total body behaviors of injury prevention, movement optimization, mental and motor skill performances delivered through specializations of sports medicine, personal training, wellness coaching, and community outreach. Look good, feel great, perform well with Total Body Wellness and Performance www.totalbodywellness.net, 350 East Ogden Avenue Suite, 104 Westmont, Illinois. Contact Larry B. Love, 708-218-7373 for more information. And Larry's right here today. So uh, what I want to do now is I want to go to, you know, we really had some really good discussion on, on the, the, the topic, but I really kind of want to bring this home, uh, what I call the assessment of plan. So in, in medicine, when we see a patient, uh, we hear about their chief complaint, we're discussing the issues, and then we come up with an assessment plan. And we kind of try to summarize what we've learned. So what I want to do is, uh, I'll start with Chris. Chris, what are kind of your three takeaways, or just takeaways in general, uh, for our listeners and our viewers as far as their responsibility to public health? if they have a responsibility of engagement yeah. and all. But what are your kind of takeaways of some of the points that we're talking about today? Yeah, sure. Uh, and I think people have a responsibility to be engaged. It's not you know, a one-way street. It should be bi-directional. We want people to engage with us. So one, I would say, get informed and you know, engage with us on social media. Look for information that's coming out. Have a discussion about what the threats are, whether it is chronic disease or obesity or opioids, whatever it is. Uh, find out more about that. Two is to get engaged. So we've got you know, lots of different uh, folks here today, whether it's with your physician, it's with a university, it's with governmental public health, it's with some other agency. Find out how to get involved with that. And you know, either there'll be a call for your participation or call someone. Get involved. Knock on a door. Uh, ask for help. Lend your resources. We want you to be engaged in that process. Um, and then three is really to advocate for change. Like it's not enough to just hope that the world becomes a better place or your neighborhood gets more healthy. Uh, if you need sidewalks, if it needs to be safer so you can go outside, uh, advocate for those things so that people know that it's important and that you can do something about it. And you've got to, you've got to increase that. You've got to create that sense of urgency. And I think everybody here today has a sense of, urg a sense of that urgency because this is what we do for a living. And, and how do we get that to the next person and by having these relationships and having these discussions and building uh, building a, a foundation over time can hopefully lead to that change. So Larry Love, <laughs> what are your top like three takeaways when it comes to public health? So I'm going to piggyback just a little bit on what Chris said, but I'm going to say that kind of towards the end. Listen, engagement is a responsibility of the community and the public health sector. So in order to be engaged, there has to be compliance. There has to be compliance. If, if there are calls to action and programming that's put out there, the community needs to comply by either attending or responding. Second, there needs to be something that's very efficient. You can't put on long campaigns that people will not respond to because you know people are always oh, I don't have the time, or, you know, I have something else to do. So the efficiency is what kind of sparks, sparks their attention. And last, the follow-up of, is it effective? Mm -hmm. Is it effective? Why keep promoting the same programming if it's not working? And so the great thing about public health is this right here. It's a social responsibility, but it also gives us a chance to see change. And if there's no change, it allows us to go back to the drawing board and see what we need to kind of do over and revamp. Chris, let me ask you another question before we uh, get some thoughts from Dr. Chang. How are you guys measuring things at the public health level? How are you measuring the outcome? Mm -hmm. uh, I know from a medical standpoint, obviously we look at, at laboratory results, and we look at other uh, measures like 30-day uh, uh, readmission to the hospital, but how are you guys measuring what you're trying to do? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a huge responsibility for us, right? We're funded by the public, funded by taxpayers. It's government and public health, so we've got a responsibility to evaluate. So we have a great group called Impact DuPage that really looks to assess the health of the community over time. So if we put programs into place, 
uh, or surveying high school kids about their substance use. We are looking at hospital-based uh, admission statistics and health outcomes. We're looking at death statistics, uh, trying to make sure that we're bending the curve or you know, getting things to a level that we're satisfied with. Uh, and that comes two ways. One is setting a goal, so when you start a program, what's the goal you're trying to hit so that you, when you do come back to evaluate a year, two years, three years down the road, are you there or not? And if you're not, what do we need to do differently? Because you're right, it's insanity, the definition of insanity, to keep doing the same thing over and over again. Um, so certainly for people uh, in our area, impact2page.org is a great way to find all kinds of data about how the health and community looks today um, and where it's going over the next five to ten years. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Susan, what, what are your thoughts, what are your kind of your the takeaways for our listeners today as far as engagement in public health and hopefully trying to create a sense of urgency? Sure. I kind of feel like I should get a freebie because I had to go last. <laughs> and they said everything I was going to say first. But um, I think Chris did a really good job of bringing it at the macroscopular, or macro level where, you know, we're looking at population health, right? We're looking at rates of diabetes, rates of obesity, rates of cancer. Um, and Larry did a really good job of bringing it further into assessment, which is incredibly important um, because if you only do intervention and you never see if your outcomes are there, then you really could do anything. <laughs> there is no you know, structure to it. Um, I'm going to take a different view because they got six out of the way already. <laughs> and I'm going to bring it down to the microscopic level. And uh, my takeaways are going to be things that individuals can do in the community that I hope can lead to a healthier overall community. I would say the first one to piggyback what Chris and Larry have said previously is to become a really good critical um, consumer of information and in that when you're looking at a study, you know, it's really tempting, especially if it's a study that goes in your direction, right, something that you enjoy, like ice cream is good for you for breakfast, which is something that was really going around a year ago, that's a true um, study, or, you know, red wine, no, a 30-minute uh, bath is better than going to treadmill. Right. Or a glass of wine is better than like a cup of orange juice, right? Like, right. Yeah. There's certain <laughs> there's certain studies that are very tempting, but you know, I think if you need those tools, certainly look to your universities, look to CDC, WHO. You know, first look at the source. Look at who is telling you the information. And there are sources that I would deem probably more peer reviewed, or they're already criticized before they even get published. So you have someone putting that layer of fact finding for you in place. The second one is low-hanging fruit, right? I think it's really hard for someone who's struggling, who wants to get in shape, to instantly become in the prime of their health. But as the saying goes, if you're doing nothing, do something. If you're doing something, do more. Um, if you're not getting eight hours of sleep, increase your sleep by 15 minutes. If you're not drinking enough water, you know, bring one extra glass of water with you when you go to your desk or maybe you know, at night before you go to bed. Um, if you're not eating any fruits or vegetables, maybe try introducing one piece of fruit, like an apple, into your routine a day. So don't think it's all or nothing. You know, it's meal by meal, day by day. It is not a you know, instant fix. Um, and the last thing is I'm going to go back to saying nurture your relationships. I think a large part of our healthy communities is being a good neighbor. You know, I think there's a um, Mr. Rogers documentary coming back, and he was a good man. I think we need to be better neighbors. I think we need to take care of each other and to reach out to even the people you aren't as familiar with in your communities and saying, you know, how can we help each other? How can I learn from you? How can I be a resource for you? And what can I do to make your life better? Because in doing so, you know, you will make your own life richer for it. Excellent. And my kind of take on this is change can seem impossible. It can seem overwhelming. I want people to start out slow. I want people to think about what's important to them. And then once they decide what's important to them, I want them to take slow, measurable, and actionable steps. When I think about it from a physician's standpoint, I just want people to come in and get a physical. If you haven't seen a doctor in more than a year, you're due for a physical. And I want people to utilize the primary care doctor as their advocate. When you're having good health and good living, they can focus on other things that are important to you, your family, your community, your longevity, your relationships. But without having that foundation, we may not be set up for future success. So success is possible. We just want people to find that chance, find that urgency, establish those rituals, establish those relationships, and hopefully you'll be better off for the long haul. So uh, I want to thank my sponsors today, 
Benedictine University, DuPage County Health Department, Total Body Wellness and Performance. I want to thank my guests, Mr. Christopher Hoff, Mr. Larry Love, <laughs> and Dr. Susan Chang. My name is Mark Gomez. Uh, you can call me Dr. G. Next week, check me out. We're going to be talking about obesity wars. Again, you can follow me on my Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at To Your Health, doc, with, uh, to your health Dr. G. Also, check me out on my website, www.drmarkgomez.com. Take care and peace out. See you next week. Bye bye. Good job, everyone. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.